Coach Kerr, welcome. Nice to have you along. Appreciate the support, listening to the broadcast. It's a love. Draymond Green is here. Why well. didn't he coach the Knicks? He's a lifelong Bulls fan. Damn you. You could do Steve. no wrong for me. Good decision. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. I know misery loves company, but why would you wish that on Steve Thank Kermack, you. given all that's happened in the last three years? What's good? What's happening? Welcome to the best 60 minutes of your day. We are 150 minutes or so away from the start of the 98th NFL season. Wow. Later, we'll give you the correct answers. Yeah, right. To all the big burning questions, only for you to make fun of us when we're proved wrong later in the season. And coming up, we'll head out to Flushing Meadows, where the ladies are most definitely putting the U.S. in U.S. Open. Uh, but first, we start with a big event. Um, and and some big news for the Patriots. Uh, Patriots wide receiver Malcolm Mitchell was placed on IR due to a knee injury, which means the Patriots will be without Mitchell for at least the first six weeks of the season. Now, this is the second huge hit to that receiving core with Julian Edelman already out for the season. But the Patriots, as they often are, aren't exactly in dire straits with Chris Hogan, Brandon Cooks, Danny Amendola, and new acquisition Philip Dorsett. But not surprisingly, of course, the overwhelming favorites for this season and virtually everything are the Patriots. Uh, they begin their title defense as huge favorites to win Super Bowl 52. Our football power index gives them a 32% chance to take home the Lombardi Trophy well ahead of the Seahawks, Packers, and Steelers. Just to put that into perspective, at this time last year, the Packers were the FBI preseason Super Bowl favorite, but Green Bay, as the favorite, just had a 12% chance to win it all while Seattle was a 15% favorite entering 2015. Sounds about right. 32%, huh? Yeah. Are we at this point, especially given the news we heard today about Malcolm Mitchell, we already know some of the other injuries they have. Are we over-respecting the Patriots? Are we have a little too much confidence that, that they can just weather everything? Is that such a thing? There's no such thing. It's too much respect for the Patriots. Haven't they earned it? They've earned a lot of respect, that's for sure. But I wonder, I know everybody points to last season and said, hey, they lost Gronkowski. Oh, they only went on to win a Super Bowl. And he's obviously the best tight end in the National Football Maybe League. Maybe of all time. Maybe of all time. But with the Patriots, should you, instead of looking for the big loss, as in everybody says, as long as Tom Brady is upright, yeah. could it be death by a thousand paper cuts? All right. And I'm not going to pretend that Malcolm Mitchell, um, that he is the biggest offensive star on the Patriots. But every time we and they certainly prove us wrong when we start to doubt them. But at some point, even for the best teams, even for the best franchises, it's just like, oh, well, maybe there's a little bit more vulnerability here. This time last year, did you know who Malcolm Mitchell was? Did not. <laughs> Mid-round mid round rookie most, most people who stepped did up not. when Gronk went out. So <laughs> yeah. before he was making huge catches in the Super Bowl, he was just another mid-round pick that was, the Patriots were developing until it was time for him to be next man up. Just, this is what I mean by they've earned this. And there's no such thing as over-respecting the Patriots. I, I think this needs to be said because we take this for granted. This decade, 2010, 14 and 2. 2011, 13 and 3. 2012 through 2015, 12 and 4. Last year, 14 and 2. Just, just let that sink in for a second. Let that sink Thank in. Thank God you don't have the pick. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it's, it's like, show me the weakness. Mm -hmm. And if the argument is, well, they can't continue this, well, why not? You have the greatest coach of all time. Check. Greatest quarterback of all time. Check. Greatest tight end of all time. Check. Continuity and consistency with the coaching staff. Check. A culture that is conducive to taking it week to week and treating every week like it is a Super Bowl. Check. A weak division. Check. Home field advantage most likely in the playoffs. Check. So, yeah, undefeated is certainly harder than it seems. If any team could do it, absolutely. But they're there time and time again. They got a backup if something were to happen to Brady, who we'll talk about later. They got a, a – who? what running back is going to be inactive given the, the caliber of running backs they have? They have assistant coaches like Dante Skarnicki keeping an offensive line together. Matt Patricia on defense. Coaches that should be head coaches elsewhere staring, staying here to keep this thing going. So I just want you to show me where the weakness is that said that they shouldn't be the old overwhelming favor. I don't know if it's necessarily a weakness as much as, again, as I said, being vulnerable. Now, as excited, Matt Patricia, that was his shirt it was, because right? as excited as Patriots fans are to open the season tonight as defending Super Bowl champions, it's arguable they may be more excited to boo Roger Goodell. As you pointed out, Patricia, he was the one that got this thing rolling when he wore this t-shirt after they won before depicting Goodell as a clown. Well, tonight, Patriot fans, they have 70,000 rally towels with that same image, thanks to Dave Portnoy the founder of Barstool Sports. What a come up. And they also have this huge billboard of Clown Goodell, which he may see on his way to Gillette. 
So Foxborough is now Pettyville. Um, Which I know you love. I, I do love it, but at, at some point, look, the Patriots and the Patriots organization, their fans, they so won this ar- argument, if you will, for all of ro- what Roger Goodell tried to take away from them last season by suspending Tom Brady, by bringing more character doubts to this franchise. If you put, you know, couple this along with Spygate, you guys have won. Like, you could let this go. Why? Like, you won. never let it go. You ne- won. Never LIG. You won. You've embar- you embarrassed the commissioner the moment he had to hand you the you Lombardi. You made him look like a fool. Exactly. So remind him that he was a clown in this situation, okay? And there's a clown when it comes to most of these situations, quite honestly. Because if you're a Patriot fan, you have no reason to turn down the volume on the booing for Roger Goodell, okay? Every time you have an opportunity, you need to remind him how foolish that entire deflate gate saga, Ooh. in hindsight, and for some foresight and in the moment was, okay, how a guy who allegedly needed an advantage back two years ago went and lit it up in the second half of the AFC title game, lit it up against the Seahawks, did it the following year, and obviously went on to win the Super Bowl again last year. So how much of an advantage did he really need well, or need I mean, to see? Mike, so they, the point, won, they won. Yeah, but you they know won. what? Just because the point's been proven doesn't mean you need, don't need to reiterate it, okay? And if you're a fan, you're not beholden to respecting him. If you're the team, if you're the team, you certainly have moved past it. If you're Bob Kraft or Bill Belichick or Tom Brady, you don't want to be consumed with showing up Goodell. But if you're a fan, that's why he gets paid $40 million to be the bad guy, to be the face of a league-wide witch hunt, which it, which we all agree it was, led by other owners who were envious of the Patriots. This isn't just a deflate gate. This is spy gate. Right. They've, 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 they've been anti-patriot, or that, there's been an anti-patriot sentiment around the league for a while. Some of it deserved. But this is what you get when you get the last lab. You get to call a commissioner a clown. So at what, how many Super Bowls are enough until they it's let never this enough. go? It's never enough. All right. Absolutely. Okay. Could never go too far. <laughs> Kyrie Irving will be on the cover of 2K18 in a Celtics uniform. Tweeted for the culture. Okay. <laughs> Not sure I get the correlation, yeah, okay. but okay. Yeah, but I'm getting the game. It's your, co- I'm, your I'm cover. I'm getting the game. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, Cavs finally introduced ITJ Crowder and Ante Zizic. Should have saved the seat for that unprotected Nets pick. And after Isaiah's hip prompted the Cavs to ask the Celtics for more, the press conference, which fittingly, like the trade, was delayed, started with three consecutive questions about his recovery. The Cavs acknowledged that Thomas will miss the start of the season, but they weren't putting a timetable on him. When did you know um, that you had suffered a, a torn labrum last, last year? So, again, like I, I want to... I, I don't want this to be the Isaiah Thomas hip press conference. And so I'm, I'm just going to, with all the respect, shut down the, the hip questions. If we want to talk about Isaiah, let's talk about Isaiah the All-Star. Let's talk about Isaiah, the guy that averaged 29 points a game last year. Let's talk about him as a leader and what he's going to bring to this franchise um, in terms of his performance on the floor when we get him back. So, again, guys, I, I, we appreciate the questions, but this is not going to turn into the Isaiah Thomas hip press conference. Again, three straight questions to start it off. Mm-hmm. I, re- I respect how the young new GM, how you put the, the media in check there. I respect Who it. are you right now? Uh, a veteran member of the media who's in a position to be able to be objective. I'm not turning my quick- back on anybody. I'm not right. t- Look, with all due respect to Kobe Altman, you don't get to tell them what they should ask you. Or yeah, you do. What's the whole point of a press conference, right? That's for you to field questions. You can't control what questions I ask you, and it just so happens that the player you traded for, there's a lot of injury mm-hmm. Issues right. with him. You went back in and wanted more in the trade. You exactly. got Miami's 20, So people seconds. are trying to figure out what exactly mm-hmm. happened here. That's you your it. job as the media. I got it. You right. got a job to do. I got a job to okay, do. Okay, but yeah. I'll be Kobe Albert. I got a job to do. My job is maybe not to control what questions are asked, but my job is to control the message. Okay. Control the he narrative. Can control, control the, the message, environment. But you don't get to tell me what to ask. I can tell you. Could, you could, I can not ask it. I can you, tell you. Or you can just say no comment. I can tell it you. It keeps saying it. Look, we've answered the questions. We've told you there is, a, is no timetable. We have told you that we're not going to rush it. It's uncertain. We're not going to put unfair expectations on how soon he can be back so you can hold it against me later, Miss Member of the Media, because I know how you so do. So now, now you, know, you side with management. It's like, it's like that, I'm not with management. It's like that, Mike. I'm saying this is a GM who nailed the trade, okay? This offseason, they let go of their previous successful GM. Chauncey Billups turned him down. Didn't get Paul George. Didn't get Jimmy Butler. 
of another LeBron decisions on the horizon. This should be cause for celebration and not concern. This, it, this event is to introduce Isaiah Thomas and, the, and everybody else that you got in this trade, okay? So you are not trying to let people change the conversation into, well, wait a second, did they really break even or even win this trade given the uncertainty about IT's hip? No, you're trying to let people know, hey, we got a, we got a great player who's recovering and not to mention, Jamel, LeBron's watching. LeBron's watching. So you know what? It's my job, much like Katie did with Russ against Mark Cuban. It's my job to get my players back. So I understand his perspective. When you balance an objective, Jamel, as a journalist, you can understand both sides Look, of the story. Uh, your Boston Globe colleagues are rolling in their graves right now, looking at you, <laughs> coming out against us. You was, used to be one of us, if Mike. I would, I would write the story, that's what I would write about. All right, look, for the first time since Wimbledon in 1985, we have an All-American Women's Semifinal Quartet at a Grand Slam, Venus Williams leads the bunch as the only one of the four with an appearance in a Grand Slam final. Sloan Stevens, Madison Keys, and Coco, excuse me, Vandaway have combined to win 138 Grand Slam matches, while Venus has 262 by herself. And with that, we welcome in tennis great Mary Jo Fernandez right there on the scene. Now, as I just said, the last time four American women were slated at the U.S. Open semifinal round was 1981. What kind of statement has this final made about the overall health of the game when it comes to American women's tennis? Well, it's a tremendous statement for American tennis on the women's side. I mean, it has been a long time since we've seen four. It's a rarity. Um, I think the good thing for American tennis is not only are we seeing them now compete for a Grand Slam title, but to begin the tournament, we had 23 Americans in the draw, which is a very big number. So Venus and Serena have led the way for so many years. 20 years ago, Venus got to the finals here as a 17-year-old, and now you're seeing a lot of the influence that both Venus and Serena had on this next generation. They're playing well at the same time. They're pushing each other. Coco, Madison, Sloan, they all play together for Fed Cup for the American team. They've been on Olympic teams together, and they're inspired at the same time. So this is a great sign for things to come for American women. Mary Jo, which ladies' semifinal run most impresses you? Well, they're all pretty impressive. I mean, when you think about Venus Williams, the leader of the group, 20 years after reaching the finals here as a 17-year-old, that she's still contending for a major. She's, you know, trying to get into her third Grand Slam final of the season and potentially be number two in the world. I think that's just remarkable. But then you look at the stories of Sloane Stevens coming back from foot surgery, didn't play for a year, and just in her fifth tournament is in the semifinals of the U.S. Open. With Madison Key, she's had two wrist surgeries. She's only played four tournaments since Wimbledon, and she's won so many great matches. She's got the most power in the entire group. Coco Vandeweghe comes from an athletic family, and she's putting it together with her coach, Pat Cash, the mental side of it. But that's what it's going to come down to. It's a new position for these young women. Venus has been there before. Who's going to handle the pressure, mm. the occasion, the tension of trying to win a U.S. Open title? All right, Mary Jo, i got to put you on the spot a little bit. Of the four Americans that remain, who you got? Who okay. has the best chance of winning this all? That's a tough one. I think they all have a great chance. Um, I picked v Madison Keys to win it before the tournament started. I'm going to stick with her. I think she has the most upside because of her huge power, especially on the forehand. But she's got a great serve. She's aggressive from the baseline. She's been coming to net quite uh, convincingly, and she's a great mover. She beat Coco twice this summer. She's had a win over Venus. She does have one loss against Sloan. But at the end of the day, it will be mental. Who can deal with the pressure the best? All right, thanks for the knowledge, and we will talk to you hopefully tomorrow after a great couple of matches. All right, Keys and Coco is later. Alrighty, Let's talk thanks. about the first match. Asked about facing Sloan Stevens in the semis, Venus Williams asked reporters, I don't think I've ever played her, did I? Yep, they met in the first round of the 2015 French with Stevens winning in straight sets. So now I'm going to put you on the spot, Jamel, tonight. You team Venus or team Sloan? You know I can't go against the family, Mike. Yeah, <laughs> My Nobody wins with a family fuse? <laughs> the Williams sisters. Um, it's just that Venus, especially for her to be at this point in, the, in her career, she's become such an ambassador for the game. I can't pick against her, even though I know what you're going to say. I know what you're going to say. What am I going to say? Sloan Stevens, I mean, it's just as much as her time as anybody else's. I mean, she's somebody who has been clawing her way to get to this point, especially this past year. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at who is more deserving. Well, not deserving, but 
somebody who hasn't won versus somebody who's won quite a bit. I get it. That's I not what it. I was going to say. You weren't? But you said it well. Okay. If I were, you said it better. All right. So that was great. All I was right. going to just say, I was going to turn the tables on you. A minute ago, you tried to play the journalist card. What's the better story? What's the better story for you to write? Is is it the up and coming Sloan Stevens, 83rd ranked? See, that's not running fair. to the final. That's not fair. Or Venus, who, <laughs> look, this resurgence has been amazing to watch, but has been there, done that legacy, is cemented. I think it's Sloan coming off the surgery is the better story. And there is something to be said for what Mary Jo Fernandez said, and that in terms of the health of the game for the American women. We all win. Everybody wins, and especially for Sloan, that would be a great moment for her. All right, on this in college football, generally speaking, college football coaches try to keep other coaches' names out of their mouths as a professional courtesy. Urban Meyer said, not today. Uh, he took issue with Texas coach Tom Herman, once his offensive coordinator at Ohio State, who said in the wake of his debut loss to Maryland that he, quote, couldn't sprinkle fairy dust on the players he inherited at Texas from Charlie Strong. Uh, Urban said, come on, man, I don't know where that came from. This is what he told CBS Sports. It's like a new generation of excuse. He said, I can't rub pixie dust on this thing. He got a dose of reality. Maryland just scored 51 points on you. Dang. Here's more from Meyer on his irritation with coaches who blame the previous administration. When I hear coaches say, well, it's not, these aren't my guys or, you know, wait, wait till he gets his guys in there. I, I cringe. Whose guys do you think they are? Once you become the head coach, they're officially your guys, and many you say, I do. When I hear that, I just, you got to be kidding me. Why would a coach say that? Because that, what do you think those players are doing? Those players are listening. So they are your guys. Show me the lie. That was Show that was me deep. the lie. That was, that was real. And you know what I respect about it is, like, it's one thing to – to talk about a rival or chastise somebody that you don't have a connection with, to do it with your former OC, somebody mm -hmm. whose connection with you is on his resume. I mean, Tom Herman, a successful guy. I think he's a, a good fit for Texas and is going to get this thing turned around. But nonetheless, in part, got where he is because of his connection to Urban Meyer. So Urban's like, I, didn't, I taught you better than that. Right. You didn't get, you're not representing me when you go out and say, well, I wasn't going to turn this mess around overnight or clean this up overnight. Because, I, look, in fairness to Tom Herman, I don't think he meant it the way it sounded. But I know as somebody who talks every day for a living, oftentimes... I say things that don't come out exactly how I meant them. I don't think he meant to disparage Charlie Strong or disassociate himself from the players, but that's how it does sound. Right. Because the opposite would never be said. If they go out and are, and are impressive in week one and climb up into the top 15 after beating Maryland, nobody's saying, well, thanks, Charlie Strong, for laying a great foundation that Tom Herman could oh, pick up. Oh, he'd be up. all too happy to it, take the it credit. It would be Tom Herman's a miracle worker. Right. No, and, and especially people don't want to hear it when, what, your recruiting class last year ranked second in the Big 12. All right. So no one wants to hear this whole, oh, I, I, I didn't have enough to win. And, and here's the thing with Tom Herman. Like you, I think that it's very, he's made convenient target practice all week, and especially given how everybody wanted to coordinate him and a lot of other coaches, the scuttlebutt is like he's overrated, he hadn't proven enough, and he gets this big job. And I get that. He faces a certain amount of professional jealousy. Don't think that's what Urban Meyer was doing. But since he got there at mm -hmm. Texas, his message has been, we need to change the culture. We need to do something so much different, which every time you say that is a direct it's shot at the person who exactly. was just there. Now, here you come with your $10,000 lockers, okay, and people want to see the results. And I'm a fan of what he's doing. No, I, I am, I too. Know, yeah. like, I, I, I like the motivational uh, stuff that he does. I like his message. He relates to recruits. Like, I, he's going to get this done. I, I do believe that. But, hey, man, you're at Texas. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear that you don't have enough, and they don't want to hear uh, that expectations are, are too high. So you right. saying we don't belong in the top 25? No especially, one wants to hear especially that. Especially when, you, hey, you're not clapping back at the GOAT. Right. One, one of your for, former employers and one of the greatest coaches of all time. So you can't say that he's wrong. B, everywhere Urban Meyer's gone, immediate turns or turnaround. Oh, that first season. So it doesn't matter. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And sometimes coaches can be coached too. And this is a teachable moment for Tom Herman. Time to take it or leave it. Jamel, in an ESPN.com panel of experts, Aaron Rodgers was voted NFL MVP. He's a popular pick. All right, so take it or leave it, Jay. Aaron Rodgers will run away with MVP. I'm going to leave that. Not that he isn't obviously a strong candidate for MVP this year. You know who I like for MVP? Russell Wilson. Okay. That's who I like for MVP. I'm buying okay. all the hype about him being slimmer. Supposedly looks the best that he has in his, in his career in camp. We know what that defense is going to be like. He's clearly a playmaker. I like Russell Wilson. Not a bad MVP. pick. I'm taking it, though. Do we have take it? Put mine up. Make sure it's right. <laughs> okay, take it. Yeah. yeah. 
We, I'm taking this because I think Rogers is going to pick up where he left off after his run the table comment when he wasn't missing, wasn't throwing a pick, was just on fire. Didn't get it done in the postseason, obviously, but I don't think you're going to have the slow start that's going to require the relax or run the table type call. Like, he's just, he's in a mental place with the Packers in this offseason, the tight ends, the wide receivers healthy. Give me Aaron Rodgers. Just lighten it up from day one. All right, speaking of quarterbacks, Ben Roethlisberger has been hinting at retirement. He said this offseason he's, quote, taking it one year at a time. Take it or leave it, Mike. This will be Roethlisberger's last season. I'm going to leave it because I'm not sure. I think he out here Brett Favre. Not trying to see if he still got it. Shout out to three drama. stats. I, I just think <laughs> the, the offseason, the training camp, the obligations – are, are, are a new system at this point in his career. So I could see him kind of dragging it out and maybe, you know, kind of maybe showing up late next year and the itch still being there, especially with such a talented team he's got around. I'm going to take this one. He's been talking about this, not just this past offseason, but he's been hinting at this for a couple of years now. Foot out the door. You know how it is when you're, they always say, if you're already thinking about it, that means mentally you kind of like you're saying done. about relationships. Yeah. Like you've been you start up planning that six months to before then, before you actually do it. All right. There's a lot of hype around Jameis Winston and the Bucks. In fact, he's my fantasy quarterback i'm gonna go so far well let me ask you first let me ask you take it or leave it best qb in the nfc south in 2017 Jameis winston that's a division right. with the last two mvps and a future hall of famer in it matt ryan's still here right mm -hmm. just curious because <laughs> uh I, look it's tough when you between matt cam drew Brees, yeah. him this sounds like a slight but when you consider the competition but it could be last Jameis is 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 the quote worst quarterback in that division. I think he explodes this year. I think he explodes. I mean, what, they, they set him up to succeed. They took a tight end 19th overall in O.J. Howard out of Alabama who's amazing. He may not be their number one tight end because he still likes Cameron Bray. You got Deshaun Jackson, Mike Evans, the stable of running backs. He's got so many weapons around him. My only concern, and I don't mean to trivialize this, is how does Irma and its impact in playing 16 straight, how does that affect him? But he is ready to lead that team to a division title and by that rationale and statistically be the best quarterback in the division. Wow. Uh, the Cowboys, they are still favorites to win the division despite Ezekiel Elliott's suspension. Uh, take it or leave it, Mike. The Cowboys will repeat as NFC East champions. You know, I'm going to leave it. A special year last year, everything came together for him. And while I think Dak Prescott could be a better quarterback this year, maybe even statistically, I don't know that it manifests itself in wins. I think that offensive line is a little shakier. Still one of the best, but a little shakier than people realize. Zeke's going to serve those six sooner or later. Defense, we know about the, the absences and the suspensions and that sort of thing. I like New York to win a division on the strength of its defense. Okay, uh, I'm going to take this, though. I still, I still like the Cowboys. I think Zach is going to be improved and it will pay dividends. And I'm buying all the hype about him and Des Bryant having a renewed two streak. Him and, Des, him and Des Bryant, that awesome receiver for the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> I know I'm not picking. <laughs> Notice one team we didn't pick up. All right. Uh, my man Adam Kilgore of the Washington Post, he wrote today, or at least somebody wrote a headline on his column today, that the NFL's best defensive player may sit out indefinitely and nobody is talking about it. So let's talk about it. According to Adam Schefter, Aaron Donald's expected to sit out the opener, take it or leave it, Donald will sit out the whole season. Uh, I'm going to leave this. I, it, it, even though I, I believe Aaron Donald, A, should be paid and certainly paid like one of the three or four best players in football, it's just when it comes to missing games. I think NFL players, more than anybody else, are more aware of the clock that's ticking on their careers. So I think at some point, though he has a fair, salient point, I think he comes back. I don't think he's accrued these, this many fines. He's willing to start giving up game checks to turn back now. He's making 1.8, which is big money to you and me. But to him and what he deserves to be the highest paid defensive player in the league, he's willing to sacrifice that to get what's coming to him. I mean, he, people think he's the best player, regardless of position, yep. in the league. I know he's the most handsome player in the league. Okay, so pay that man his money, and if not, you'll miss him starting Sunday against, well, maybe not Sunday against Scott Tolzien, but <laughs> going forward. You're right. So Tom Brady will try to become the first quarterback in NFL history to start all 16 games in a season after turning 40. After turning 40. The only quarterbacks to start double-digit games after turning 40 are Favre, Vinny Testaverde, and Moody. Favre is the only 40-year-old quarterback to start a playoff game in the Super Bowl era. So my question to you, Jamel, they say Father Time is undefeated. Is this the season that Father Time actually takes a lead to on Tom Brady? Yeah, there's exceptions to every rule, and Tom Brady is a, a, a gross exception. It seems crazy to say because you pointed out quarterbacks who have been some of the best to ever play this game, what happened to them at a certain age. The difference is 
I don't know if any of them are in the shape that Tom Brady is. I think, and, and <laughs> I almost brought this up earlier when we talked about how the Patriots fans still hate Roger Goodell. Well, the upside of, of, of what happened with Deflategate is Roger Goodell, that's four less games that your quarterback played him which allows him to be a little bit fresher at this point in, in his career. I think Brady is just as hungry as he's always been. Yeah. He is so in love with the process. I just don't see him falling off. I just don't anticipate that he's just going to go off a cliff and all of a sudden not be the Tom Brady, the great quarterback we recognize. I wouldn't say I'm a Tom Brady of this business, but a bad day for me is a lot of people's best day. <laughs> Tom Brady, the last three years, 33 touchdowns and nine picks, Don't break 36 arm, touchdowns and seven picks, <laughs> 28 touchdowns and two picks. So even if he slips, what are we talking about? Right. 25 and 10? <laughs> what, is, what are we <laughs> right. talking about? Like slipping from up here, from being maybe the best quarterback, if not player in the league at 40, is not saying a whole lot. I said before, I, and, and if I had to put money on Tom Brady versus father time, I'm putting my money on Tom Brady because I think he is that rare exception. He's in shape. The legs are usually the first thing to go. As you mentioned, he's in shape, takes care of himself. The team takes care of him, not just in terms, in terms of the protection, but the system. He takes care of himself. He's talked about how he's learned how to absorb punishment, how to take hits and not have it be a season in the injury. He hasn't missed a start since, I want to say, 2009. The year after he came off the ACL, yeah. or a start due to injury. Right. Obviously, the suspensions notwithstanding. And also, too, the versatility in that system is one of the reasons why I'm not worried about Malcolm Mitchell's absence, because they train their receivers to play every position on offense. That's why some people can't transition to the, to the Patriots system. Likewise, if Brady's skills are somewhat diminishing, they're not going to ask him to do things that he's no longer capable of doing. So, no slippage at all. You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know, when you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. We take it now to Foxborough, where Sal Pal is there. So, Sal, last segment, uh, we talked about whether undefeated Father Time would take a lead, if not beat 40-year-old Tom Brady this season. We both don't think so. Now, you've talked to people who know Brady. What's his mindset heading into his 18th and possibly final season, at least with the Patriots? Well, you know, he talked, Michael, all week long about having butterflies going into this game. So I kind of talked to people who know him, and they were like, come on, man. That, that's just not the case. This guy is chomping at the bit to play in this football game. He quote, Here's the quote, Michael. He wants to prove he can do this at 40. <laughs> now, I also talked to a lot of defensive-minded coaches around the AFC who also say, listen, the first thing that goes at 40, because no quarterback has ever finished a 16-game season in right. the NFL at age 40, the first thing that goes at 40 is your legs. His yep. arm is fine. Okay, the trigger is good. It's the legs. And so what you got to do is make the pocket feel dirty around his feet and his ankle and his knees. The Chiefs have done that. They were the ones who injured him eight years ago. And there they got a great pass rush. The front seven of the Chiefs is their strong suit. The thing is that Bob Sutton, the defensive coordinator with the Chiefs, does not like the blitz. They were last in the league in blitz percentage last year. So what they'd like to do with Marcus Peters is press cover. They play a matchup zone defense with a lot of man-to-man, -man, more than many man-to-man -man in any other team in the league. Press cover and force Brady to hold the football. The longer he holds the football, the better chance they have to get at him and hitting him. Now, that's, uh, that's the six and edge NFL matchup joining together right there, <laughs> Sal. Pal. That's good stuff right there, baby. Now, uh, Sal, of course. Uh, the Jaws is smiling right now. <laughs> of course, the Patriot fans, they're looking forward to celebrating their defending uh, champions, but I don't know if they're looking forward to as much as that as to booing Roger Goodell. Now, what are you hearing about how Roger Goodell will be received by the Patriot fans tonight? Well, let me get you up to date right now, Jamel. It's a where's Roger situation. I was told much earlier in the day by NFL security that he was going to be here by about 4 p.m. Now, we all know, like, the traffic coming in here is real bad. Mm -hmm. But he, I just texted NFL security about 15 minutes ago, and they said he was still not here. Now, if you remember, 
<clears throat> excuse me, in the preseason, he was here for the Jaguars preseason game. He made an unannounced visit to Robert Kraft's box, right? And the Boston Globe took a quick picture of the two of them. It wound up on their website. And the social media backlash was so bad. I mean, I can't repeat the stuff that was on social media here on this TV station. So uh, on the air. So we know about the billboard on Route 1. We showed you pictures of it. And maybe they still have a shot of it. They could put it up. With the clown nose, that's the T-shirt. And then 70,000 <laughs> fans, 70,000 fans are going to get a towel with the same depiction. I've seen them all over the stands. People have them everywhere. And but some Patriots <laughs> fan just threw one at See, me. this is a <laughs> real Sal Pal shot, though. You got to have a prop. I mean, come on, man. Come on. Come on. We're right on top of the stands. It's, I, mean, I mean, they're everywhere. And... Uh, you know, that, that was crazy. Okay, I'm sorry. What's your next question? No, 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 no. Good? I, I was just admiring how you directed the show from Foxborough. Right. Like, throw that shot up for me right there. That's a yeah. veteran right there. I'm telling you, Sal. You Tell already in mid-season form. Thank you so it, much. Appreciate it, Sal, for fella. Enjoy the rest of the night, man. Don't go ham on that guy, please. <laughs> All right, let's get to uh, the latest with uh, Michael Bennett. On the heels of Roger Goodell, the aforementioned Roger Goodell, putting out a statement in support of Michael Bennett. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver and NBA Players Association Executive Director Michelle Roberts co-signed a letter to the league's players, encouraging them in the pursuit of social consciousness. Now, meanwhile, when it comes to uh, Michael Bennett, Steve Grammas, the president of the Las Vegas Police Protective Association, has written a letter to NFL Commissioner Goodell calling for him to take appropriate action against Michael Bennett. Bennett has accused police officers of racial profiling, saying they pointed guns at him and used excessive force during an incident in Vegas last month. The Las Vegas Protective Association represents active and retired members of the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. The union is responsible for investigating the Bennett incident. That is being handled by the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Here's... Michael's brother, Martellus. It gets emotional when you think about it, like overall, but, but yeah, like sometimes like a hug is the best thing you could give. And it's just, I mean, I don't really, I don't really know, really, you know what I'm saying? I don't really have the answers, so you just think, what if, you know? Two seconds this way, two seconds that way, the whole thing is different, so. So for me, it's just, I'm just be happy to see my brother because there's a chance that I couldn't see him. All right, again, this is uh, Detective Steve Grammas. He's the president of the Las Vegas Metro Police Protective Association. Uh, his statement read uh, in part, while the NFL may condone Bennett's disrespect for our American flag and everything it symbolizes, we hope the league will not ignore Bennett's false accusations against our police officers. We believe that a fair investigation will establish that our officers responded to one of the most dangerous calls a law enforcement officer can be assigned. Our officers, who are both minorities... Yeah, I know. Had just, the legal right past. and obligation to detain <laughs> Bennett based upon the nature of the call and Bennett's unusual and suspicious actions. Now, the NFL PA and the NFL have since both said that there is no grounds for an investigation and no apparent violation of the personal conduct policy. Your reaction to all that? Uh, my reaction, um, well, one, kudos to the NBA. And I, I think that they have before, they, they didn't even need to make that statement. I think everybody has known given the relationship with their players, given how players like LeBron James and Chris Paul and D Wade and Carmelo Anthony, what they have stood for publicly and privately and been supported uh, by their union and by Adam Silver. We saw with Donald Sterling with what time it was. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, it's, it's a different kind of league for a lot of different reasons. Right. So kudos to them for making it even that much more clear that they welcome their athletes being active with social justice issues. As for the statement by the police union, I can't say that I'm surprised. I can't even say I'm disappointed because to be disappointed, I would, differently. I would have been to expect differently. It was just so much in that statement that just exposed so much. Um, 
<laughs> we both uh, took a took a time out as soon as uh, you read the statement about our officers who are both minorities, as if that has anything to do with any it's a of clear this. Like a basic understanding of how racial profiling works. Correct. People and of color can racially profile other people of color. Yes, they can. Especially in, in this and situation. And it's look, you look at the officers in the Freddie Gray trial. Mm -hmm. Many of them were of color. All right. So this is about how black men in this society and black women too are viewed, judged, and feared Correct. by a lot of those with guns and badges. Mm -hmm. uh, putting that aside for a moment, interesting that they brought up his national anthem protest, mm -hmm. which let me further know mm -hmm. what this statement was really about. Look, we already knew what this situation, how it was going to unfold in terms of how, what the reaction would be. And of course, ever since Michael Bennett put out this statement about what happened to him and, and therefore, and also publicly talked about it, people have been nitpicking saying, oh, but it doesn't look like this. And where's this evidence? And this, they've been looking for ways to undermine and basically call Michael Bennett a liar. They so, need it to be a lie. They, they need do. it to be a lie so that comfort. they can undermine the credibility of the cause. Mm -hmm. That's what it comes down to. First of all, you mentioned not being surprised. Cops aren't going to cop to racially profile. Not going to stand up and say, you know what? That's Come exactly to think what of happened. It, now that you've told me. Yeah, because oftentimes it happens subconsciously. Sometimes consciously, oftentimes consciously, but sometimes it is subconscious. You may not know that you did it. Clearly, they don't know how racial profiling works if you went out of your way, like we just talked about, to point out, oh, well, they're Hispanic, so why would they racially profile a black guy? They were, that's just not how this works. Poor training, poor education on the part of these officers perpetuating that myth. But I just want to ask this. Why is, let's talk about the why, okay? The why Michael Bennett feared for his life. Tell me why, according to him, and what reason does Michael Bennett have to lie? Not as if, not as if this conversation or this cause needs any more martyrs or examples to be credible or true, despite what people want to believe. What does Michael Bennett have to gain by fabricating a story? He was released. He's not covering for anything. He wasn't arrested. He wasn't in trouble. So why would he go to such great lengths to make up something as traumatizing as a gun being pointed to your head saying, I will blow your effing head off? Why would he do that? Okay. So why is that necessary under any circumstances? But here you go again. Don't rush to judgment on the police, but look at his suspicious behavior, a.k.a. you acting like a thug, you acting like a criminal. All I want to ask is, why is, in this case, Michael Bennett, but in the cases of people that look like Michael Bennett or similar to Michael Bennett, why is their fear for their life dismissed as irrational and unfounded, but when it's reversed, a trained police officer, when it comes to sanctioned killings by agents of the state of un often unarmed civilians, why is their fear for their life understood and accepted and sympathized with? Well, you know why. Because it's much easier. That was rhetorical, yes. I know. You know why it's much easier to sell being afraid of us as opposed to the other way around. Time for the doing too much countdown. Okay, we're getting or we have gotten to the bottom of a mystery. It turns out that Aaron Rodgers uh, was trying to fix Sam Decker's garbage disposal, but it wasn't broken. It just wasn't plugged in. That's why he was holding I, I didn't pay close plug. enough attention to the picture, but you know what that makes? That's, uh -huh. that's, that's a me type thing. By the way, again, real MVP. Real MVP in, in NFL, MVP for fixing this. This morning, I spent taking lemons out of my garbage disposal. I'm like, why does it sound like it's broken? They say you're supposed to put lemons in it to make it smell better. Oh. Yeah, my wife did that, but it was annoying me. All right, Eagles owner Jeffrey Lurie was asked about his favorite Andy Reid story today, and Lurie said the first time the two went out to dinner, Andy Reid ordered three steaks. Of course he did. Andy Reid ordered three steaks back when he was in the punt pass and kick contest. <laughs> And that's Andy Reid, right. ready to eat tonight. <laughs> eat right. that Patriots defense. I don't, he'll order a big steak if they win tonight. Most important question is, how it did he... medium. Okay. And where was it from? Capitol Grill. Yeah, where was it? Del Monaco. Okay, where was it from? Where was it from? And whether or not he had A1 or not. Because if he had A1, He's he should have got up from the table. Yeah. All and right? The little chef should have got up. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, more bad Browns news. <laughs> it's Again. not funny. There's no such thing. Uh, three months after trading for Calvin Pryor, he was released today after fighting with teammate Ricardo Lewis. Can't have that, man. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I don't. I got nothing. And then, on, and then, Miles Garrett's outfit is it two weeks at least now? High ankle sprain. Which he got stepped on. You try to make it like it was something that was just a. No, I, I wasn't trying try to, try to make it like it was I so brown. If you're if you're the Browns a Browns fan, I, I understand. You, Cavs, why Ohio State. Indians going for 15 in a row tonight, baby. It's good days in Cleveland. That's uh.
So Hawaii linebacker coach Sean Dugan, he no. sustained a dislocated wrist and a fractured elbow after trying to chest bump six foot seven, two hundred and seventy pound defensive lineman who looks like the mountain from Game of Thrones. <laughs> I'm through four seasons the now, by the way. You through four? I'm through four seasons. I'm powering through. I'm catching up. So it's, so good. it's like that. I'm so good. Is but it he better went, than look, the wire? But he went too high. Look, you can't go that high. See, you had nowhere to. Oh God. Uh, is it better than the wire? Oh God, no. It's great. Some people said it was. No, I don't know who those people are. All right, so check this out. these people? <laughs> 55,000 Chilean soccer fans say they will march. They will march in hopes of getting national soccer star Alexis Sanchez to break up with his girlfriend because they blame her for his recent poor play. See, that's See, just... Aaron Rodgers was complaining about the local media with Olivia Munn. They out here having rallies and protests. They out here like, give, give us free or give you free from your girlfriend. Oh, it's not. It's a game. It's the, it's the beautiful game, but it's not a game. It's a good day if you hate tanking in the NBA because sources tell Woj that the NBA is aggressively pursuing draft lottery reform to de-incentivize tanking by implementing lower odds on the NBA's worst teams. It wouldn't start this year's draft, but next year's draft. You like it? I do like it, um, but I like my good day better because according to a study conducted by the personal finance company Smart Asset, Detroit, Detroit is the best place in the nation for pizza in 2017. So all you Northeasterners constantly talk about Pepe's and all this other stuff. Stuff. We own pizza, baby. We do. Ha! And I'm out. We'll see y'all tomorrow, <laughs> man. We had such a good show until that. <laughs>
it's just not going to make this easy. Um, so, like I said, it's a day-to-day -day thing, really trying to get better. Um, oh, it's been two weeks, so I'm itching, I'm itching, but uh, just patience and trusting. Yeah, I don't know how confident I would feel that he was playing if I'm a Giants fan watching his response there. But do they, how badly, I guess, do they need Odell Beckham Jr. to beat Dallas? Not, in my opinion. First things first, he really, doesn't the, need practice. The best but player on the team. Ben McAdoo's always already said he doesn't have to practice this week in order to play. If he's medically cleared, he'll put him out there. So he doesn't need the work. So there's that, okay? Mm -hmm. We're not talking about practice. But, I mean, he's, it'll be nice to have him, and he is their best player. But you have Eli Manning, right? You have the guy who has a, as I like to say, has a Hall of Fame resume, but a lot of people think is a Hall of Famer. So you have Eli Manning. Is that a You're not little bit of shade? It's not shade. It's okay. perspective. It's proper perspective okay. on Eli Manning. I'm not going to derail the answer to your question by getting off onto, onto Eli. I'm saying he's capable of going into Dallas and beating what is not a doomsday defense it's almost by like, any stretch. It's almost like you're saying, well, if Eli's all that. I, yeah, basically. <laughs> well, you got, but he, they, you got Brandon Marshall this offseason, right. who I know is older but not washed up, in my opinion. You got Sterling Shepard. So you mm -hmm. got plenty, plenty of quality weapons on offense when you don't have to score that many points because your defense locked them down pretty well last year. I'm talking about Dallas's offense. That's a really good defense. I'm not saying that you should automatically look at this as an L, but look, Dallas is one of the best teams in, in, in the division. And as we're about to talk about in a moment, they will be at full strength offensively uh, come Sunday. Mm -hmm. I think they do need him uh, to beat Dallas because it, things just change. The dynamic of that offense just changes no when Odell Beckham Jr. is not And I don't mean to marginalize or minimize how significant a player he is and how he changes the games, but he's, that's not an excuse if you don't have him. You still got enough talent on both sides to win that game. So you mentioned Cowboys being at full strength. Ezekiel Elliott's six-game suspension upheld by arbitrator Harold Henderson on Tuesday night. But because of the timing of the announcement, he will be allowed to play on Sunday. A U.S. District Court judge will make a ruling Friday on the injunction Elliott is seeking to prevent the NFL's discipline. On the practice field on Wednesday for the only padded practice of the week, and by all accounts, Ezekiel Elliott has been on his game. This game, Sunday night, primetime, week one, Good look or bad look for the NFL that Zeke is on the field? I think it's a bad look. It's a bad look because it's just another reminder of just how ridiculous this entire process has, be, has been. And that is not to belittle or diminish the seriousness of the accusations. And, yes, they are still accusations against Ezekiel Elliott despite this uh, suspension being upheld. So now all of a sudden, uh, and I'm not saying that, that when football fans are watching this game, they're going to think – uh, that it will take away their enjoyment from the game. I mean, some people, they, that may be the case, who aren't as necessarily as good as at com compartmentalizing. But this will be discussed. This will be talked about. It will be a cloud over the game. And all the ugly things that have been about this back and forth between them, it's hard not to see them uh, coming to the surface during all of this. A cloud over the game? No. See, <laughs> here's the thing about the NFL. And the problem is they know it. They always win even when they lose. Mm -hmm. And they've already done their job, which is appear, despite the flaws in the investigation, in the process, appear to be tough at long last on the issue of domestic violence. So he's not out there because Roger Goodell didn't get a tape or Roger Goodell needed video proof or, you know, went soft on the issue. He's out there because Ezekiel Elliott exercised his right to challenge his suspension in court. So they cooperated with the judge because what do they have to lose? Right. They, they're, they're trying to gain credibility in the court of public opinion by saying, look, we, we slapped it with a six-game suspension, okay, per our policy. And our arbitrator upheld it despite all the flaws. Because a judge wanted more time, fine, go play week one. You think people are going to be turned off? They will be turned off, but you, No, but, to but, the contrary, they're going to tune in. It's more reason to tune in. As if Dallas and New York needed more reason but you to know, tune in. But you know what it looks like to a lot of people who already look at how they, how they handled this entire investigation. Oh, you guys just wanted him available for this primetime game. Like, yeah. people are going to put this back on the NFL, even though there was obviously some legalese behind no, this. I, I, honestly, I think it's just, you're going to serve your six. Now or later, as long as you serve your six. That's all we care about. We care about Article 46 and our process and procedures being upheld. Whether you pay the piper now or later, that's obviously up to the courts. But in the meantime, sure, we'll take you on the field for week one prime time, which any publicity is good publicity. All it's going to do is add to more intrigue to the game. It's another storyline mm. to talk about. Instead of cutting the head, big storyline. Earlier today, Michael Bennett tweeted out 
a statement detailing a frightening encounter he says he had with the Las Vegas police the day of the Mayweather McGregor fight. Bennett said he was ordered to the ground and an officer threatened to kill him if he moved. Now, here's a video that TMZ obtained of a portion of Bennett's confrontation with police. I told us to get out. Everybody ran. Did you ask me a question, sir? Okay, man. Put your hands together. Now, the Las Vegas Police Department responded with this tweet earlier this afternoon. Um, they also have said that sometime within this hour, we expect to hear from them. Uh, but for now, here is Michael Bennett earlier today at Seahawks practice. It sucks that the country that we live in now, sometimes you get profiled for the color of your skin. And um, it's a tough situation for me. Um, do I think every police officer is bad? No, I don't believe that. Do I believe there's some people out there that judge people on the color of their skin? I do believe that. And um, I'm just focused on uh, trying to push forward and keep continuously championing the quest for um, justice for people, um, keep pushing uh, equality for oppressed people. And um, that's, that's just what, the, that's what I'm about and what I keep doing. I know a lot of people are like, oh, did, did he want this on himself? I didn't ask for this moment. It just happened to be me. And um, I'm just lucky to be here to be able to speak about it. At I, I, any moment, I could have made the wrong decision and whether move or felt like I was resistant or doing something wrong. And you guys would be wearing, the Seahawks would be wearing the patch with number 72 on it. So I'm just lucky to be here right now. When people ask why I sit down, and this is why, this is the things that I go through, what people go through that look like me or people that's, that's going through something different. Uh, Michael Bennett's brother, Martellus, he echoed similar sentiments on Instagram. Uh, he wrote, a lot of people feel like it couldn't happen to them because of status, neighborhood or whatever. But in all honesty, you could be next. I could be next. Your son, daughter, brother, father, grandpa, sister, cousin could be next. Also, here's Pete Carroll offering his support to Michael Bennett. Uh, Michael Bennett uh, unfortunately experienced a, a horrendous incident on August 27th. And uh, we're thankful that he's safe, and, and uh, we take this opportunity to say that we stand for in support of him and anyone facing inequalities. Uh, what happened with Michael is a classic illustration of the reality of inequalities that are demonstrated daily. And, uh, you know, may this incident inspire uh, all of us to respond with compassion uh, when inequalities are brought to light and... Uh, allow us to have the courage to stand for change because we can do better. We can do better than this. Pete Carroll's heart definitely in the right place, but unfortunately that's not what happens because already there's some uh, Michael Bennett truthers out there. Um, and that's the classiest thing I can call some of them. But Pete Carroll, uh, he read from a prepared statement that he also tweeted. And it was something that he said in there that really struck me. What happened with Michael is a classic illustration of the reality of inequality demonstrated daily. Mm -hmm. And that's the part that I think a lot of people don't get and understand is what Michael Bennett experienced is not the exception. It is the rule in so many different regards. And lucky for him, as he even said himself, that this could have turned into an extremely tragic incident with ironically somebody who has taken up this fight from Colin Kaepernick, who also tweeted uh, his support and said that he stood with Michael Bennett um, in, in a tweet that he posted at, at some point today. There it is on the screen. And a lot of people have questioned Michael Bennett's motivations, <laughs> Colin Kaepernick's motivations. This is what they're motivated by. And I just don't know how many different languages we need to say this in for people to understand and to take hold that this is real. And it's not just happening to Michael Bennett. Luckily for him, his name is Michael Bennett, because a lot of people wouldn't be hearing about this right now. His fame, notoriety, his platform is the equivalent of camera phones. You know, uh, once these encounters started getting recorded and shared on the Internet in recent years, many of us recognize that, think about all the times this has happened when it hasn't been caught on camera. So this is happening to Michael Bennett, we're talking about it, but this probably happened to, to some person of color, some African-American, some Latino, some Muslim, in the last few minutes somewhere in America. This is people's everyday experience. But you said what people don't get. You know, I, the feeling of disappointment is, is, is a direct 
result of your expectations. And even though we've seen this movie play out time and time again with different actors, it's still no less disappointing to see how certain people are prone to instinctively rush to legitimize, normalize, marginalize, minimize, trivialize, anything you can think of to discredit this experience. You know, because they say that the, the first step to solving a problem is admitting that you have one. There are way too many people in this country and way too many people in high places in this country who still won't admit that we have a race oh, problem in this or country. Or they admit it in the, asp- in the abstract. Like, I really hate when people say, oh, I know racism exists, but that's just not the case here. Well, well if it exists, where? Who? When? It has to exist somewhere if you acknowledge that there is a problem, right? And a lot of this has a lot of this has to do that people there are some people who are in, in a privileged enough position to not want to believe that this is really America. They just don't want to believe they it. Choose not they to. choose not to because they, they because if you believe to. that this is in America, then you have to believe and, and think about and really sit down and reflect. What does this say about me that I take a part and I gain advantages from this very system? See, well, I'm glad you said system, because the one thing in Michael Bennett's tweet this morning, his, his very eloquent letter that I took exception to was when he said, the system failed me. Because as you know, I know, and most of us know, a system cannot fail those it was not designed to protect in the first place. And part of the system is continuing to perpetuate the idea of African-American man as threat. That's how it continues to get validated. These actions were what people say, don't rush to judgment when it comes to the police. But they're quick to put the, the alleged victim on trial or the person that the police are sworn to serve and protect that's been violated or feels he's been violated quick to put him on trial what did you do what didn't we see what did you do why didn't you why didn't you obey why didn't you listen to commands so for me it's just it's the same conversation going around in circles over and over again and it's just disheartening to see the reaction to it and it shouldn't matter that he is michael bennett that's the point Mm -hmm. it shouldn't matter how much money you have how you dress and that was probably he put it oh Look, Jay-Z said it recently. We've been saying this since the beginning of the time. You're still just another one, no matter what you've accomplished. And he goes through this now. And for all the people who said to him and Colin Kaepernick, well, what do you have to complain about? You're rich. You're playing a game. You, ha- you can't relate to the people that you're fighting for. Yes, you can. Yeah. Yes, you can. And imagine a child in that situation. Michael Bennett's a grown man. Imagine how often teenagers and children are traumatized in that way and their lives are never the same how many people they may not lose their lives in those situations but emotionally mentally and psychologically they're scarred for life because even if you haven't experienced that if you look like michael bennett you know you can you know you can be next even if you haven't what what, experiencing that fear in your day-to-day life that's not what this is supposed to be about we can go on and on and yet People are going to find ways oh, to discredit We'll discuss everything. this again, I'm sure, this issue. Bucks at Dolphins postponed until week 11 in place of both teams' bye week, meaning they'll play 16 straight weeks without a break, and their rescheduled week 11 game is coming off a short week for Miami, which doesn't get to play a true home game until October 11th. But obviously, player safety takes a back seat to the people in the path of Hurricane Irma, a Category 5 monster with potentially catastrophic winds of 185 miles per hour. Our NFL insider Jeff Darlington is, of course, in uh, Miami, Florida, with Bucks Dolphins postponed, and, and best to you and your family, Jeff. We, we talked yesterday about you getting them out of town. Uh, we understand that they are safe. Uh, postponement until week 11. Miami won't get to see its home field at Hard Rock Stadium until October 8th, as I mentioned. What's been the reaction from the Dolphins in the grand scheme of things, Jeff? Well, I would say that the reaction has changed. I think that uh, originally there were some players, and maybe they continue to be frustrated by the fact that they will have to play 16 straight games. I did notice as soon as the NFL did decide to postpone the game officially, there seemed to be a change in tone here at the Dolphins facility and really from the players that I'd spoken to that they just shifted away. They said, this is the bye week now, on to the bye week, and it's time to get ready for the storm. And I think that uh, I sensed at least that for some of these people, they went from being football players to South Florida residents. And there is a strong distinction when you look at the projections of this storm. Uh, I saw Cameron Wake go into a, a closet nearby where I'm standing right now to pick up a bunch of pallets of water, throw them in his trunk, and get out of here. They deflated this uh, indoor facility behind me for the first time in 12 years. This facility is designed to withstand some serious hurricane force winds. 
When they take this bubble down, that shows you, I know it's just symbolism here, but it shows you the seriousness that we here in South Florida are taking this storm, which certainly supersedes the possibility of a football game anywhere, whether here or somewhere else, when the families of some of these players will be here in South Florida. So that is the tone that I have sensed. Adam Gase, to his credit, told his players, we're going to deal with the cards that we've been dealt, go protect your family, and we'll get back to football once this storm passes. And again, and again your loved one's in good shape, Jeff? Oh, yeah, we're good right now. I'm going to get out of here and go put up some, some more shutters and uh, hope for the best. I'm not alone down here. South Florida community is, you know, it's, we're just hoping this thing doesn't hit. That's all right, all. man, we're hanging We there. hope that on Monday everybody wishes that uh, this game was moved elsewhere. We hope on Monday we find out that the game could have been played because exactly. that would mean we dodged a bullet. Exactly. We Good do perspective. not want to deal Good perspective with this once again, man. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. We're yeah. thinking about you. Stay safe for sure. A shout out to whoever put a few bucks on Howard to upset UNLV. Howard was a 45 and a half point underdog and beat UNLV 43-40 in Vegas. Behind the heroics of that man there, quarterback Kalen Newton, yep, Cam's brother, Howard pulled off the largest upset in college football history via point spread. Now here's Cam on trying to live up to the younger Newton. He has that it factor to let or, or to have guys follow him. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and that's what you want in your quarterback. You know, for people to take a program like Howard, to take a program that isn't necessarily known for certain things and, and, and changing the whole retrospective of the way people think. And I've just been seeing a lot of Cam Newton, little brother, Cam Newton, little brother. You know, I just would prefer him, his name, just be Kalen. You know, he's deserved that right. Hopefully, you know, this is not the the the, um, the highest point of his career. With him being a, a, a true freshman, you know, he's still got a long way to go. Kalen, as much as you admire your brother, do you feel the same way? Are you already sick of hearing Cam Newton's little brother? Would you prefer to just be Kalen Newton? Of course. You know, I've been trying to be Kalen Newton my whole life, I would think. But, you know, I guess it comes with the territory. When people see me and see the last name, they see, I guess, the most famous. But, I mean, I'm trying to be my own man. I am my own man. And I will hope that people respect that. Well, I think people definitely respect it now after that big win uh, for Howard. So give us some idea of what this week has been like for you following such a huge upset victory. I mean, do you get, are you getting extra mambo sauce wherever you're going? <laughs> what's this Excuse week? Excuse from class. Right? What, what's the week been like? Well, it's been good. You know, uh, great vibes around the whole campus. Uh, I haven't yet we got some mambo sauce, but... You know, I've been eating good, living good, sleeping good. It's just been an amazing experience. So are you just coming off the practice field or are you just rocking the uniform all week? Because if I were you, I would. I wouldn't have taken off my uniform all week. I'd have been big man on campus. You just finished practice, though, I assume. <laughs> right, I just finished practice. Um, I haven't took my uniform off since you. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I wouldn't have a roommate if I didn't take my, right. if I didn't take my uniform off. But... <laughs> Uh, I've been living good, man. You know, uh, it's on to the next one, though. Well, I was going to ask you, too. Like, I, I'm sure you guys are on a high, but, but how do you enjoy the win and appreciate what you accomplished and yet continue with this culture change that you guys are trying to uh, instill at Howard? How do you kind of put that behind you and move on despite all-time great upset? Uh, just hard work, you know, uh, speaking it to existence. You know, uh, all week we've been saying we're going to do it again, we're going to do it again. And, you know, hard work pays off. You know, the story's already written. As my OC would like to say, uh, Coach Marion, he said, you know, it's already written. We just have to show up pretty much. You know, if we work hard, work hard, work hard. Good things will happen. What, tell us what Mission Possible means to your program. Mission Possible. Uh, Coach London has multiple quotes that keeps us going. You know, every day it's a speech. Every day he has us ready to go. You know, uh, Mission Possible means everything. It means show class, go to class, and treat people with dignity and respect. Uh, he's a father figure to all of us right now. Um, it's we, ours, and us. You know, this team is doing big things right now, and it's mission possible in every category. Now, coming out of high school, you drew some interest from Kentucky Christian University, Texas Southern, Savannah State, but you settled on Howard. Why? Howard... <laughs> It was just the grace of God. You know, uh, my father said, uh, we're going to look at Howard. And 
the coach there had just left and it was just a lot of prayer, a lot of prayer. When I came to Howard and at the time, you know, I really couldn't see why my father could, but I just trusted God and trusted my father, trusted my family and everything worked out perfectly. You know, it couldn't have went better. So you are Cam, okay, just for purpose of this question, you are Cam Newton's little brother, but he does take advice for you because we were reflecting earlier today. I feel like this was the Titans game from a couple of years ago when he mentioned you at a press conference and he said that you told him to dab on them folks. <laughs> that was you, right? Yeah, it was me. Okay, <laughs> so, so who's the best dancer between you and Cam? Uh, the best dancer? Hmm. I mean, I got rhythm, you know, bow-legged old me, uh, <laughs> this lower body, it's just, it's tricky, you know, if you see the pictures now, I'm, I got a lot going on lower body-wise, so he can have the dancing, you know. Okay, well, speaking of pictures, we've spotted some pictures of you. Uh, who's the more um, adventurous dresser between the two of you? Who's got the more interesting fashion sense? Well... He'd go above and beyond to, to just get looked at. <laughs> but for me, you know, uh, I like to show off my legs. You know, I'd take some skinny jeans and, you know, show, <laughs> show off my both legs. I, I think the ladies like it. I think everybody like it. But uh, as far as him, he likes to tell. I'm not sure what he has going on a lot of times, but I'm taking notes. I'm taking <laughs> notes, waiting on my time where I can go shopping. You know, right now I'm wearing Howard Bison. All right, now I don't know if you can see it, but we have a photo of you at prom and... Man! You look clean, man. I, I don't know how to describe that look, but what went into the, the thought process behind that outfit? <laughs> that outfit, well, I wanted to go out with a bang, you know. Um, it was my senior year. Uh, Cam was encouraging me to go out, with, go out with a bang, go out with swag. And what better way to go out with gold? Um, I went to a, a local guy downtown Atlanta, uh, and he hooked me up. My father, you know, he looked at it, he looked at it, and he was like, you sure that's what you want? And I was like, yeah, you know, I don't want to look normal. I'm not the old school, going to Bible study type of fit. I was ready to show out. Well, uh, you certainly are showing out on the football field. Personality, so all that runs in the no family. No doubt that you are showing out uh, whenever you go out. So good luck, Kaylin, the rest of the season. Um, maybe we'll be talking about how yeah. we're pulling more upsets as the season progresses. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. H-U, you know. <laughs> You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know, when you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. So IT took to IG, posted a video entitled The Book of Isaiah, hashtag keep doubt and hashtag killer season, uh, some behind the scenes from his rehab. It was voiced by, among others, our own Jamel Hill. I mean, she took a clip from the right, basically. Took a, glad he was watching. So if you do two things today, if you read two things, read Tom Haberstroh on the significance and seriousness of IT's injury and read IT's first person account of the trade on the Players' Tribune. This is one of the quotes from it. Yeah. I'll just say it. That stuff hurt, talking about the trade. It hurt a lot. And I won't lie, it still hurts. It's not that I don't understand it. Of course I get it. This is a business. Danny Ainge is a businessman, and he made a business move. I don't agree with it just personally. And I don't think the Boston Celtics got better by making this trade. But that's not my job. Read the full thing for yourself. You know, you read it. What's, what's your, uh, well, what do you mean? What's your biggest takeaway? Well, I knew when he said, but that's not my job, but that's not any of my business. He might as well have No, I, I got that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. but actually what, what you put there, that was my overall takeaway from the piece. And I think because we live in a, a, a sports society that's very desensitized when it comes to the movement of players, mm -hmm. um, their transactions, and especially with the advent of fantasy sports, is yeah. that that makes them see players as even less than human. And I appreciated the fact that he admitted that it hurt and that, the, as he just said, the fact that it still hurt. And I think a lot of times it's funny because when players react emotionally to being traded as he has, they tell them they're being soft, right? Or they tell them to suck it up. You're getting paid millions of dollars. Who cares? You know, move on to the next. 
But when KD, and he's talked about this, decides to leave, then the fans want to get in their feelings. And then they want their feelings to be respected. And so I guess uh, what this... Some re- of those are apples to oranges. Sorry to cut you off. Some yeah. of those are apples to oranges. I know sometimes I, I, it's I don't the manner of it. make a general blanket statement about, well, players take their career in their own hands, fans get mad, teams deal players, fans... But that, but that is what happens, though. Sometimes it's a little... There's some nuance there, involved, but sometimes continue. Sometimes there is, but nevertheless, I think they, people get wrapped up in, into not understanding that this is for players, regardless of what the paycheck says, mm-hmm. this is a lifestyle change. They have oh, families have to tell that are kids. rooted. Yeah. Thankfully, his kids took it well. Yeah, especially his son, who was like, oh my God, Dad, you get to play with LeBron. Yeah. So I think bringing this emotion to it, it just kind of added... Uh, it, it just made me, in a lot of ways, feel some level of empathy for a lot of Boston fans who were very upset about the fact that IT was traded. Well, and I was just simply pointing out that I don't know that you can always compare every transaction made by the player in this day and age to the ones made by the team. That said, though, there are people that that's never going to resonate for. People are never going to see the hypocrisy or the inconsistency in that because I think most people look at the team as their team. So they're always going to take the side of their team as in you abandon us. You abandon this community. You abandon this franchise, which I support. I supported you. So the, that's for the KD example, for, exa- for instance. Like, even though IT was different, he poured his heart and soul into Boston, mm-hmm. loved the city, loved the organization. It moved on from him. I don't think people are going to now have a paradigm shift as it comes no. to player empowerment. All that said, I don't dare doubt IT. I read Tom Haberstroh's piece. It was discouraging about the effect that these labrum tears can have on players. I don't dare doubt IT. I'm rooting for him, as we all are, uh, but it was discouraging. It's not about the will, it's about the body. Um, There's Uncle Drew getting some buckets. Now, Isaiah Thomas, he just said, as you pointed out, Mike, that the Cavs are a team nobody wants to see and that he didn't think Boston got better. Well, nobody told that to Danny Ainge, who explained why Kyrie will be even better this season. I think you'll see that he's a better passer. Um, I think the people that watch Kyrie play a lot can see his passing and his potential there as a passer, but LeBron was pretty much the point guard in Cleveland, and Kyrie was a, a point guard often when Ky- when LeBron wasn't on the court and so forth, but I think that he's a fantastic passer, and then I think, you know, defensively he's got to improve, and and I think that he will in Brad's system. Mm. So you buying that, Mike, that Kyrie will be a better playmaker, passer, and defender in Boston than he was in Cleveland? I am. I think he has the potential to. Just like I said a second ago, as I was saying about Isaiah Thomas, I would not, uh, you know, doubt this this man's heart and this man's will to come back and allow Cleveland to continue to contend with his help. I'm not going to doubt Kyrie Irving's desire to evolve, not just a change of scenery to escape Cleveland and be the the person that, in theory, the organization consults. I think. I don't think he's going to get that in Boston, but be the face of a franchise or or something like the face of a franchise. I don't think it's just about that. I think he does want to grow and evolve as a basketball player. And Brad Stevens coaches a different way. So the systems, the sets, the culture, the demands, the 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 environment. No slight to Cleveland in this level of expectations, but look, having spent most of my adult life in Boston, it's different up there. They got a different level of expectations. So I think. There is going to be a lot of scrutiny on him, even though he didn't, he's not going to be carrying a team. And he even downplayed the notion of carrying the team. I think there's going to be a lot of scrutiny on him to see him be better in the areas that people have recognized are weaknesses for him, like his playmaking ability, like his defense. When engaged, he he can do whatever he wants with a basketball. Anything he wants with a basketball. Get wherever he wants on the court. I think he can change his mentality and be more of a distributor than he has been. He has to be with the players he has. I think Kyrie will be looking to prove a point. Exactly. Um, Look, the whole reason why a lot of people just balked at the idea of him even asking out of Cleveland, uh, especially after they'd already won, was because there was this basic notion that, Kyrie, you're just not that guy. You're not that guy to ask for whatever it is you, you are asking for and seeking outside of, of LeBron James. You're better off staying foot and staying underfoot beneath him. That's your best position. And I think that's something that's going to motivate him. He knows that people think – people believe he's not capable of certain things. And I think that could be the best thing for him to come to this situation. And not only that, how many times have we seen players that play with LeBron James? He's so great that subconsciously and consciously you start to put everything on him. 
Oh, LeBron oh, has no that. Oh, no question. Right? Like, yeah, you kind of take you them. You kind of rely absolutely. on them take them for granted Your a little bit. Your circumstances kind of make you a little lazier in certain respects. Exactly. And this, yeah. it, under this coach, this situation, this he, organization, he, he can't He knows the narrative. He knows the, hey, what were you before LeBron got there? Right. What were you when LeBron was off the court? That's why I said he really hit the jackpot because he went to a team where he does not have to be everything. He just has to be a better Kyrie. Let's stay in Boston. Let's take it or leave it real quick. Buster only says the Red Sox high-tech cheating and side stealing on steroids. Take it or leave it. That Major League Baseball needs to come down hard on the Red Sox. As I pointed out yesterday when this story broke, I have a hard time. I'm leaving this because I have a hard time trying to understand the hip- the hypocrisy and all the different layers and nuance with the cheating rules in baseball. Dave Dombrowski saying, oh, I don't consider this cheating. Well, Okay, it's different levels to it. So hit hard, no. Slap on the wrist, I can the definitely The expectation is that's going to be a fine or, or maybe some of the parties involved might get suspended. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it and from this respect. If you're serious about the rule, you got to enforce it. Because if you're going to do something that's not going to discourage them or dissuade them from doing it, who, who's to say somebody else won't do it? If you're not going to actually penalize them where it hurts. There's a buzzer now. A slap on I don't care about no damn buzzer. <laughs> I'll keep going. A penalty is not going to dissuade them if they can't actually feel it. So if you're serious about the rule, be serious about the punishment. All right. Well, now we can move on. <laughs> Glover Quinn of the Lions says, Larry Fitzgerald tells his defenders, hit me high and I'll just pay the fine. Just avoid the knees. Take it or leave it. Fitz paying defenders fines for this reason. And I'm going to take it for two reasons. One, Larry Fitzgerald, one of the classiest and smartest guys. I think he probably meant it, that he would mm-hmm. pay the fine. And I'm going to take it because this is, in spite of all the head trauma awareness, this is the reality in the NFL. A lot of players would much rather get hit low, or get high, excuse me, and be out for a couple of plays or a week than hit low and out for the season. Yeah, uh, Odell Beckham Jr. tweeted something uh, very similar today about how he would be willing to put in on fines if it meant uh, that he wasn't in the situation he's in now where people don't know whether or not he's going to play. So for a lot of guys, this is what that means. Oh, good job. See, I, saw I, saw did that. I saw you did that. I saw you did that. I saw you did that. I'm a little too, I'm a, I'm a too Kyrie friend. That's why. right now. <laughs> Nobody worry about Jeremy. Uh, Seahawks <laughs> unveiled a new alternate logo with a face forward beat. Take it or leave it. Leave this. That's ugly. Like ostrich. Like, is that supposed to be menacing? kind of is. You know what the defense is? I'm going to take it. It's kind of growing on me. <laughs> An ostrich-looking Look, Seahawk thing. See, I'm not looking at the logo. I'm looking at the, the, the people behind the logo. Oh, they, they're, the guys, they're fierce. That's what I'm saying. Yes. But An ostrich will, will chase you down. <laughs> you, have, you have a lot of experience No, I just, I've just done the research. <laughs> ostrich are nothing to play with. They might be, look, they might look tell nice. Tell us more, uh, you know, Ron Miguel, like, tell us <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more about I think I was. I think no. I, I was watching. I was watching Tarzan. <laughs> that, that with uh, Margot only because Margot yeah, Robbie that. and Sam Jackson were in it. Wrap it up. Dude. So yeah. Anyway, the defense is loaded. <laughs> <laughs> time for the doing too much countdown, uh, where we engage stupidity from time to time. Here's How's Ray it Lewis. different from the rest of the show. <laughs> Here's Ray Lewis telling us why the Ravens didn't sign Colin Kaepernick. We were gonna close the deal. To sign him. To sign him. All we wanted to hear was hear Colin Kaepernick speak. Did you ever hear hear him speak? Steve Bashadi said, I want to hear Colin Kaepernick speak to let me know that he wants to play football. And what I've been saying for the last six months. Because of that picture comes out the next day. So now it's about a photo. Okay, so your head's where I right. creativity. So haircut, girlfriend photo. Not good enough. They need to hear from him. Need to hear from him. Vegan. Whatever. He wasn't getting signed, man. Yeah, it's, man. it's okay to admit it. And now, I mean, look, I, I can't speak for on the relationship of Ray Lewis and the Ravens, but it just felt like he just went out of his way to make sure that he created another reason to why Colin Kaepernick isn't signed. We know what it is. It's this whole right. story is doing too much, and there are just certain people who have turned this into. Never mind. I'm, I, I, nope. That's all right. By the way, inside the NFL, showtime. That's where you find it. Marshawn Lynch got his first pedicure while appearing on a DraftKings video. Mike, do you get pedicures? Nope. Why not? No. You no, I, I mean, I just don't. I think men should get pedicures. I've heard that. Yeah. I mean, I know a lot of guys are Why like, is this doing too much? <laughs> because it's Marshawn Lynch. Oh. Right? Yeah. And we have to find awesome reasons to talk about him in the show. One of the interesting things about this is... He talked about how he didn't really 
you know, he was reflecting on the Seahawks and not getting the ball. Mm -hmm. And how was a, it was kind of a good thing that happened. Turn the frown upside down. He sure did. Everything okay. happens for a reason. I clipped my toenails. Well, right. that's, that's the basic of what you should do. Uh, Bryce Harper, he has pretty awesome hair. We found out a way to make it awesomer, if I may make up a word. I mean, I got cornrows. I feel looking like Riley. <laughs> Riley Freeman. I, mean, <laughs> I dig it. Yeah, I do too. I, I, I dig it. Push the envelope, man. Yeah, look. Push the envelope. I just want him to hopefully have purchased some sulfur A or blue magic and a do rag. I just want him to get to healthy. To go along with that. I want him to get healthy too. That's what I want. Well, you know, they say greatness sometimes is through your hair, and that is greatness about. <laughs> it might be cornrows one day. Uh, Yo, if Odell Beckham can't suit up, <laughs> go find this guy. Jeez, he. He did it outrun, and he was further behind. Like he running to watch the six. <laughs> U.S. Open's quarterfinals, U.S. Women's quarterfinals, excuse me. Coco Vandeweghe taking on Carolina Pliskova. World number one. She took the first set 7-6. Coco up 3-1 in the second set. Consecutive strong forehands for a winner. Later in the second set. Vandeweghe now up 5-3. Has Pliskova on the run. Watch this. Watch the forehand, backhand, forehand combo for the win. Ooh. It's serve to become a third American to advance to the semis. Third American woman to advance to the semis. Never thought I would say this, but maybe it's been somewhat of a good thing that Serena wasn't at the U.S. Open. because Everybody else gets the shot. Let's yeah. go, Madison Keys. That's right. You could have three African-American women in the semis. Serena must be smiling. Katrina Adams. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Before we call it a day, tell people we had a good day. All right, The Rock, he kept his promise and met with 10-year-old Jacob O'Connor, who saved his two-year-old brothers wow. from drowning in their family pool back in August. He performed CPR on his brother because it was something he learned in The Rock's movie, San Andreas. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, shout out to our colleague, Victoria Arlen. She will compete on this season of Dancing with the Stars. It's a year and a half after she regained the ability to walk. It's been nearly a decade paralyzed from the waist down. She's with T.O. and Derek, Derek Fisher. Fisher. That's it for us. So we'll see you tomorrow.